Okay, just as a bit of history, to, on a personal note, uh, it was in July of 1967. I don't know if any of you or how many people are familiar with St. Albans, Queens. How many people have heard of St. Albans, Queens? Okay. In July of 1967, there was a place called the St. Albans Plaza. Herman Ferguson was among those targets of COINTELPRO. I had the distinct honor of hearing Brother H. Rat Brown for the first time. And he raised the roof at the St. Albans Plaza. And he was electric. And he talked about the fact that oppressed people in particular have to learn how to tell their own story. Because if they don't, the hunter will always win. He spoke about many things, but he was a consummate educator. The night before the Panther 21 became the Panther 21, there was a big rally at IS-201 in Harlem. Daruba probably remembers that. The next day, the Panthers were rounded up by the NYPD in what was called a pre-dawn raid. I remember also that the Black Panther Party had a office in South Jamaica, Queens. How many people have heard of South Jamaica, Queens? All right, South Jamaicans in the house. The Black Panther Party had an office over on New York Boulevard and Brinkerhoff Avenue. Brinkerhoff and New York Boulevard. Right on. I'm saying all this to say that the Panthers were very active out in Queens in a portion of, of Queens that most people would write off as being bourgeois. But it had an active Black Panther Party office in Jamaica, Queens. Without further ado, I would like to bring up as one of our keynote speakers for the night, Brother Daruba Ben Waha. Power to the people. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his prophet and messenger. I ask Allah to guide my words and to guide my actions so that I may impart some type of information to you and some truth and that any truth that come forth from my lips are the work of Allah and any mistakes of mine. Um, First of all, I want to say thanks to Susan Ross and the organizers of this uh, affair for Imam Jamil, the committee, uh, uh, Mumia's committee, and the soldiers and his troops in Pam Africa, and all of the activists who came out to make this a very powerful event for my comrade and brother and Imam, uh, Imam Jamil Al Amin. So uh, we should give a round of applause and a big shout out to, to the organizers of this event. Um, both, both Amir Khalid and Imam Talib talked about the transitional um, uh, impact of, of Imam Jamil al -Amin. This transitional impact has to do with people of African ancestry. This is part of our historical continuum. It's part of the unwritten history to the so-called civil rights era. The radical tradition in the United States has been written out of the history books. That's right by the various leaders that we now turn to today for guidance and for information and for analysis. The academicians who sit in the black, in the colleges, in the black universities, in the traditional black schools, who have written out, the, out of the history, the, the traditions of radicalism in this country from the very day we came here up until this moment. We have always had a radical tradition that contributed to our debate around those issues of our time. And that radical tradition has been obliterated along with the movements that these political prisoners represent. And I want to say something here um, off the top, that our political prisoners are in prison for one reason and one reason only. Because the victims or the targets were cops. They are in prison because of the political influence and power of the police unions in the United States. That's right. That's right. 
So when we look at Ferguson in New York and we look at the militarization of police in America, we have to understand not only where this militarization has come from and why it has evolved into the way it has today, but we have to also understand the influence of the police unions in this militarization process. The mil militarization of the police in the United States accompanied the racist repression that was visited on the African community in the 60s and after the 60s. That's right. The recent documentaries that you have seen on TV, some of them you have seen on television, some of them you have read in different uh, uh, publications, when they talk about the evolution of the warrior cop, the militarization of policing in America, they all begin in the 60s. And they begin with the rebellions in the 60s that occurred every summer throughout the black community. White folks call them riots, but we call them rebellions because that's what they were. They were rebellions. They were rebellions by a domestic colonized people. One of the reasons that the solutions to race eludes people in the United States, besides the fact that white folks don't want to fess up to their history, one of the things that, 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 that changes the narrative from one that could change people's hearts and touch people in, in the society is that in America today, the United States is an empire in denial. It's a system that has taken our chattel slavery over a historical period and reduced us to where we are today. And where are we today? We are in urban areas that have run down infrastructures. We are in urban areas that have poor housing, poor social services, police who occupy our communities and brutalize us. We are living in an economically marginalized society under laissez-faire capitalism. We are living in a sense as domestic colonials. Our communities fit the profiles of what an old colony would look like. The ec economy was controlled from outside. The police, the military was controlled from outside. The residents, the, the property and the resources were controlled from outside. So when Ferguson jumped off, and the first thing that the status quo and the media and the Negro leaders start yelling about is outside agitators. That's right, that's right, that's right. If you remember this scenario, and there's a couple of few of us in here that's old enough to remember this. H. Rap Brown, Imam Jamil, was called an outside agitator. Every city he went to that went up in flames, they said that he agitated it. He was, he was calling for riots. In fact, they passed the legislation and the law called the Rap Brown Act that prohibited the interstate travel to incite disobedience or riots, to incite riots, to incite rebellion. We need to understand that the militarization of police in this society began with the consolidation of white supremacy Hello. in this society Hello. on a whole new level. The consolidation of the right that culminated in Reagan's election has been a potent force that has determined the policies of the United States, both abroad and here. You know, in the next few months, we will be going to Geneva to present our case to the international community. There have been activist lawyers who have been working tirelessly for years to bring this issue before those institutions in the international arena that deal with racism, genocide, and political repression. So we're bringing our case again, and we're bringing the case of Imam Jamil to a broader community. But what we need to understand that throughout the Middle East, in places in Palestine, and in Germany, and in Turkey, and in Greece, Imam Jamil Al-Amin is the forgotten Imam. He is a hero. That's right. To the Muslims abroad, Imam Jamil's history as H. Rap Brown is up there with the history of Malcolm X as al Haj Malik Shabazz. So we should try to understand that what we are dealing with when we deal with the case of Imam Jamil Al-Amin is not just a simple case of a political prisoner who was thrown in prison just because he took a position and a stand years ago. 
What we're dealing with is the transformation of political and racist repression in the United States to fit the geopolitics of the present era. Break it down. You know, just the other day, President Obama stood up and declared war without end, a new perpetual war. And the villains in this war are supposedly these radical extremist Muslims called ISIS and ISIL. Now, all of a sudden, we are confronted with this phenomenon that came out of nowhere. We looked up one day and Al-Qaeda was no longer the enemy and now it's ISIS. We look up again and there's another playbook coming straight out of Afghanistan. The United States government is going to arm and fund, quote, moderate forces. And these moderate forces are supposed to marshal themselves and resist ISIL, and the United States would just be their air force, or just be their intelligence and their eye in the sky. And they'll have to be the boots on the ground. The reason why the United States has 800 and 900 bases around the world, or more, many more, some of them we don't even know about, is because the United States is an empire. It is not an old type of empire, it's a new type of empire. I call it New Age imperialism, where the armies do not have to occupy the territory or you do not have to have administrators from your government inside the territory administering the affairs of the natives. Instead, you control the global economic and their niche within this global economy. And you provide the security for them to do that. And you raise up amongst them a comprador class an elitist class to control their own people. Well, we see that here in the United States because we have a comprador class. We have an elitist class. We have a bunch of black Negro politicians who will stand up in solidarity for Israel and their murder of women and children. But they will not speak out and stand in solidarity on the steps of Washington, D.C. and demand decentralization of the police in America and demand justice for Gardner, justice for Brown, justice for all of those brothers and sisters who were murdered in these streets by this police. Where are our black leaders? The United States talks about their major concern about ISIL in the Middle East right now are homegrown terrorists, are individuals who would go over and fight for these forces and then come back here and use their combat hardened skills against innocent civilians in the streets of America. We are told that there are Americans and British citizens who have answered the call of ISIL and went to, their, and went to fight with them. But what we aren't told is that as we speak, as we are assembled here today, there are over 5,000 American citizens in the Israeli Defense Force. There are is a white American citizens who are in the Israeli Defense Force and who have participated in the murder and brutalization of the Palestinian people in Gaza and in the West Bank. These are American citizens in a foreign army. This is an exceptional relationship. And the reason why this exceptional relationship exists is because of the nature of the state of Israel, which is a European settler state. But the most important thing about the state of Israel to understand that it's a European settler state within the very heart of historically Islamic countries and nations and people. And that the purpose of this European settler state is to control the geopolitics of that region and the political paradigm of that region to make sure that the West and the United States have access to the strategic minerals of that region. That is the basis behind AFRICOM and the recolonization of Africa by the United States, France, and Great Britain. That is why we have the contradictions that we have in Somalia, in Mali, in, 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 in the Yemen, throughout the region. It's because the United States as an empire has strategic interests as an empire. Which brings us to Imam Jamil Al-Amin and our role. Historically, African Americans have always identified with oppressed people around the world. 
historically, we have always exhibited solidarity with people who were fighting for their national liberation and for their freedom. Indeed, it was African Americans that inspired the ANC and the South Africans to fight the way they did against apartheid. To this day, we have organizations around the world named after the Black Panther Party because they were inspired by the Black Panther Party. And now think about this. Here was an organization that barely existed for four years, but it has instilled itself in the memory of generations. For what reason? Why? Because at that historical moment, when the United States was making the transition after World War II, into the military industrial complex that has become today. It was a few black men and women, as the brother Collier pointed out, who stood up and thrust their fist in the air and said that the black community had to control its own destiny. That black power meant that black people had to control our politics, they had to control our community, and most of all, they have to control law enforcement. So in 1968, the Black Panther, 1968-69, the Black Panther Party put forward as a national program the decentralization of the police. And the idea was simple, to take the command and control structure of the police against, away from the white supremacist politicians and put it in the community. That the community, that police in the community should come from the community that they police. They should live in the neighborhoods that they worked in. Today we have military police who are robocops. They're not peacemakers. Whenever the police show up on the scene, their first objective and their first job is to take control of the situation. Not to de-escalate the situation, but to take control. And we are the ones that have to be controlled. We are the ones that are the targets of this. We have to understand that in America today, there is no such thing as police brutality. The police are doing their job when they brutalize us. That is their job, to serve and protect, to serve the capitalist elite property class and protect their interests. That's their job. So we're going to have many more Michael Browns. We're going to have many more wannabe cops want to be SWAT team members and Trayvon Martin cases. We're going to have many, many more until we understand that the real question here, and the question that has always existed from the days of slavery until now, is the right of black people to defend themselves against racist violence. The right of black people to arm themselves against racist violence. And that's the issue. And in the 60s, the way they twisted this issue was to juxtapose their right or their monopoly of violence, the police monopoly on violence, because you know the police have a monopoly on violence because they're the state. They juxtapose their right to exercise violence in pursuit of the law to our right to self-defense from violence and racist attack. They have no moral right to kill us. They have no right, they only have might. It's their armed condition and the political power that backs them that allows them to do what they do day after day after day to us. And we have to change that on the ground. So we have to understand that the most maligned amongst us, the least amongst us, those who suffer the most amongst us are those we have to organize. The homeless, the felons, the people on the streets, the hustlers, the pimps, those are the ones that we have to make a new constituency in this country. We have to register these violent felons, these so-called ex-offenders. We have to register them in the hundreds of thousands and their families. We have to register them because we have a natural constituency here that won't back down from the police, that won't back down in the face of racist law enforcement. If it wasn't for the young folks in Ferguson, we would have never seen what we saw. They're the ones that stayed in the streets. They brought every type of Negro that they could find. I know for a fact, I know for a fact because I know one or two people that was called by them. Obama's camp, the White House put out a call to the black, so-called black responsible leaders and institutional leaders and sports figures to rally in Ferguson 
especially if you came from St. Louis, if you were from Missouri, you should go down there and urge people to be peaceful, to urge people to be patient. And you had preachers showing up from all over, conducting prayer vigils in Ferguson. You had sports figures, guys that you that retired 20 years ago from baseball and football show up. And the same thing that they said, they say the same thing. What we need in Ferguson is we need sensitivity training for the police. We need more black cops on the police force. We need community uh, review boards. Now, New York has had a community review board ever since the police union in New York flipped the script and had decentralization in New York taken off the ballot. This is from 1969. And how many black folks have been killed in New York since 1969 with a community review board? So we know that the community review board is a game, it's a scam. It's, the, it's another way to get some house Negroes to sit up and rubber stamp what the police do. The chokehold that they put on this brother Gardner in New York was an illegal chokehold for over decades. How many times have people went to the community review board in New York and complained about this type of activity on the police's part and nothing was ever done about it? So we need to understand that it's the organizations that we put together that will bring pressure on these folks that will make a difference. The same way the pressure that we have built up around Imam Jamil Alameen has resulted in him being transferred from the, one of the, from the Guantanamo of North America to a facility where he could at least get some medical attention is a result of mass action. It's the result of people coming together around a common issue and doing whatever they could do to make a difference. So brothers and sisters, what I want to say now is that we have to organize the least amongst us. Surveys from various types of institutions have indicated that over 5% of the black vote is are lost to ex-offenders and felons, and people who cannot vote. We need to be able to mobilize those brothers and sisters in prison to vote, their families to vote. Why? Remember the last census? The last census that they had determined the allocation of government resources to the citizens of this country. That determined the voting, um, uh, uh, the, the voting lines, the, the, the district lines and everything. And when black people in Harlem who have two people in prison upstate New York and they don't put those two people down as part of their household and the people that have the prison upstate puts them down as residents in their county, who gets the resources? In this state, how long have we said, Jazz, how long have we said from inside the joint that in New York State over 80% of the prisoners come from only seven, only seven or eight communities in the entire state? How long have we said this? How could the majority of prisoners come from only seven or eight communities in, this, in, in, the, in the state? And then when you look at the demographics of these communities, the economics of these communities, we see that these are the most depressed and marginalized and underrepresented communities in the entire state of New York. So we have to change this. In this city alone, I called for it when Obama was first elected. Right here in, um, where were we? Were we in um, Abyssinia? And I forgot where we were at. We had the first town hall meeting in Harlem. And I stood up and I said, look, everybody here agrees that this momentum that we have behind Barack Obama and young people coming out for the first time to vote has to be translated into something meaningful in our community. And what we should do is we should build a citywide coalition in this city to decentralize public safety. Not just the police, public safety. That includes the fire departments, that includes EMS, that includes the police, that includes public safety, first responders. We need to have community control, decentralization of these institutions. All of these black cops that we have, they have the black police union, and they're crying about how the institution is racist, and it won't change unless they have this and unless they have that. These are supposed to be the experts providing the type of consultation for us to determine or create those instruments of self-rule. Why don't the police live in our community? If the police lived in our community, what happened in Ferguson wouldn't have happened. 
If the police lived on your block, the chances of him brutalizing your child or someone are very slim. The chances of young people standing out in front of your house and he lives in that building acting the fool is pretty slim too. Police have to live in our community. There has to be a residency clause. And who opposes residency clauses in this, in this city? The police union. Why can't you get the name of cops when they kill somebody uh, immediately? Police union. You can't even talk to them. The policeman doesn't even have to talk to an investigator for 48 hours after, after he commits a murder or an assault. He's protected. The police in this country have a bill of rights. It's called the Policeman's Bill of Rights. Yeah, the Constitution isn't sufficient for them, but it's sufficient for me and you. They got a Bill of Rights. That's why we didn't know the cop, the name of that cop that beat that sister brutally on the side of the road in California. It was only after there was a hue and cry from the masses of people about this graphic brutalization of a black woman. And I don't even want to go into domestic violence and beating up women. And that one was on camera too. We couldn't get the name of the cop for a whole two months. You got people that have settled suits against the police in Detroit, in Cleveland, in other cities around the country, and they don't even know the name of the policeman that killed their child. They don't know the name of the policeman. The police have a bill of rights to protect themselves from you. And they're supposed to be your servants. They're supposed to work for us. But they have a bill of rights to protect them from you. Anybody else, right after, the, after a, a, an assault or a murder, they're questioned immediately while the incident is still fresh in their mind and their statements are taken down. Not so with the police. They have a right not to be questioned immediately. You see? So my point here is that Imam Jamil Alamin's case, as an icon and an activist from the 60s, to an imam who has bayat from other imams, who, as the brother pointed out, has other imams who consider him their leader. You know, I talked about this last night on the radio. And I talked about how in the, in the, in the 1980s and the 1970s, Islam was the largest, fastest growing religion in the United States. It was the fastest growing religion in the United States. And a lot of people don't know that there was a movement right here in New York on the East Coast that the brother referred to, the Dar es Salaam movement. They had thousands of young black men and women in it. Thousands. Who had turned to Islam at a crucial point when COINTELPRO had succeeded in destroying and fracturing a movement. And there was no movements for them to join. And they turned to Islam. And they turned to Islam for much of the same reasons that we all turned to Islam. Because Islam gave us a higher understanding of what human sacrifice and struggle was really about. And as the Imam pointed out, and as he said, there are countless quotes in the Quran that urge us to stand up for the oppressed. Oh, ye who believe, who will stand up for the oppressed and the afflicted if not you? You are the best evolved of mankind. Who will defend the oppressed if not you? So when we look at Imam Jamil in prison and the fact that he went to prison and took his shahada. He went to prison and took his shahada. And the person that gave him his shahada was Noah Abdul Qayyum, a Black Liberation Army member. And all the time that he was in prison, the fear of the prison authorities was that the Muslims in prison were going to influence the rest of the prisoners and that we were basically BLA and Black Panthers in disguise using Islam as a cover. This brother sitting in this room that pounded the big yard with me and we used to sit up in San Corey Mosque. There's some of them sitting right here, some of them sitting right over there with the Imam. They know what I'm saying is true. They know what I'm saying. Long before 911, Muslims were a target in America. But the Muslims that were a target were of African ancestry. The box was full of Muslims. And one of the reasons that they feared Muslims in the prison is the same reason they feared Muslims overseas. And they had to divide them. Because the Muslims in prison stood together. If you attacked one of us, you attacked all of us. And you had brothers like Imam Jamil and, 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 and uh, uh, Baba Noah who were beloved 
by other prisoners. Prisoners will go to the box for two and three years if you talk to Noah in a, in a rude fashion. They will take your head off. This is how much they love these brothers. So what I'm trying to say to you is the fear that, that, that the brother pointed out of Muslims coming out of prison and becoming involved in struggle is a very real fear that this government has. And it's had this fear since the days that they understood that Islam was becoming a rising force in the African community. And so, wherever we turn today, the geopolitics of American foreign policy and domestic policy pivots around the repression of Muslims at this juncture in history. And why is that? You know, there was a time since the end of World War II, actually the end of World War I, when the sole ideological force that threatened capitalism in the modern Western state was the ideology of Marxism-Leninism, was the left. After World War I and the breakup of, 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 the, of the European uh, powers, central powers, it became nationalism. Everybody wanted self-determination. It was impossible for the Europeans to completely control people of color globally anymore. And when World War II came along, that was the end of it. And after World War II, the world that we are living in today was fashioned right after World War II. Israel came into existence after World War II. We need to understand that where we are today is a consequence of where we were yesterday. And when Eisenhower, the former president, Dwight D. Eisenhower left office and told the American people, and this was a general who headed the Allies' armies in Europe during World War II. He was a political general as well as a field general. And he told the American public that you have to beware of the military industrial complex. He snitched on them. And why would he say this? I suspect because the military industrial complex in 1956 and 54 was dominated by former Nazis that were taken from Nazi Europe and used by the US intelligence agencies and, and, and to develop NASA, to develop all of the techniques that they have today. They were Nazis. So should we find this surprising? that the military industrial complex is right wing and crypto fascist and reactionary and racist just like the Nazis? Do we find it surprising that the European settler state of Israel is murdering children and locking them up in an open air prison just like they were locked up and murdered in Warsaw Ghetto? Is it surprising that people have no bloodline or no tie to the land has taken the land and said God has given it to them? We need to understand we are where we are today because of where we were yesterday. And when we don't address a problem when it's small, we find it impossible to solve it when it becomes big. Right now, the enemy is on the ropes. The whole discussion in this country is about the militarization of police. And we have every clown and buffoon and expert and analyst and, and, and blogger coming out to muddy the waters and say that this militarization is something that can be reformed away. We need an abolitionist movement, brothers and sisters. The same way our ancestors had to abolish the system of slavery, we have to abolish democratic fascism. We have to abolish the system that dehumanizes and murders people around the world for profit, for murder, and for access to resources. And it begins with us. People used to admire us because of our struggle. Now they look at us as part of the problem. It's a volunteer army that the United States is using to carry out its imperial mandate. And Bubba is walking on point on this army. Our sons are in Afghanistan. Our children are going to Iraq. Our children, black children. When Muhammad Ali said that no, no Vietnamese had called him nigga, when's the last time we heard a black man say, I'm not going to join the army because no Afghan has called me a nigga. Or oh, ISIS isn't my enemy, they didn't kill me. We need to understand, as Malcolm said, we can't let our enemy choose who our enemies are.
We have to understand that these politics on the local level are the reason why Imam Jamil has spent 14 years in a, in a, in a gulag in North America. It's the reason why Herman Bell has been in prison almost 40 years. We have political prisoners that's been in jail for 40 years. Just, just check that out. Just take a mind set on that 40 years. There's some young people in this room who aren't even half that age. They've been in prison two lifetimes. While at the same time, their contemporaries from the left in Europe, the Red Brigades, the Red Army Faction, all of these organizations that kidnapped people, hijacked planes, murdered soldiers, murdered cops, they're all out of prison. Yes. All of them are out of prison. They've been out of prison 10 and 20 years. But our prisoners are still in jail. Why? Because of the political power of the police. Because of the police union. Your enemy in our streets, when we talk about stop and frisk, is not that mayor sitting up in the, in, in, in the office. It's not him. It's not the politician down the corner that's talking about getting tough on crime. It's the police union that they're afraid of. They are afraid of the union. Who here is afraid of the police union? When they don't have unions for Walmart workers. They don't have unions for people to get a minimum wage in Georgia. But we're going to be intimidated by the police union? Who are the police union but a bunch of crackers and a bunch of ne'er-do-wells that, that organize themselves into a political force? Why should we fear them? We have to get them off our back. And the quickest way to get them off our back, I've urged people in Harlem all over and over again in Brooklyn, everywhere I go, form independent political clubs in your community. Independent political clubs in your community. Each one mobilized four. Each four mobilized four more. Until you have 50, 60 people in the community that you know can vote on an issue. And then we can get out in these streets, get out there with these knuckleheads that's in the bars, that's in the streets, and get them on paper. Get them into the polls, and you'll see that Al Sharpton's political registration, voter registration campaign is going to be qualitatively different than ours. You got, I've talked to brothers and sisters on the street in Atlanta, in LA, in San Francisco, all over. And when they, they say to me, yo, Unc, like you like to call your Unc down south, they say, yo, Unc, ain't nobody ever told us that before. There's nobody your age, there's nobody, nobody ever told us this before. You have to take responsibility for this street that you are in. How are you going to be in this street and your own grandmother and your mother and your uncle and your aunt are afraid to come down the street and walk down the street because your ass is out here? And if you don't want to check it, believe that there will be a group of men and women in this community that will check your ass. You either contribute or leave. That was the message that Imam Jamil gave in the West End. When he came to that park in the West End, nobody could come out in that park after night. Women couldn't bring their kids and children to sit out in that park and enjoy a summer night. People were shooting up and down the street. They were selling dope and shooting drugs right there in the, in, in the community, right there in the West End. Imam Jamil moved in, and in less than 18 months, in less than a year and a half, that was a done deal. It was gone. And it was gone because people in the community took a proactive response to it. They didn't wait for the cops to come. They didn't call the police. Remember, the new Jim Crow that Michelle Alexander discovered for you? This new institution of school to prison pipeline that y'all just found out when some lawyers and intellectuals told you it existed? This had been going on for the past 40 years. And these black leaders that are sitting up today moaning about it, it happened on their watch. Yeah, that's right. That's they were the ones calling for more cops in the community when the crack was out there. They were the ones that was calling for more stringent policing. They were the ones that gave these crackers the justification to come into our community and stop and frisk us and abuse us and treat us like crack. These same black politicians that you have elected, they were the ones that did that. Now they're crying crocodile tears. 
Now they're marching every time some one of us gets murdered. They're standing up and they're crying crocodile tears. Martin Luther King III, the junior, came down, came down to Ferguson and they stuck a microphone and a camera in his face and he said what we need now is more sensitivity training for the public. I mean, really seriously. So we are revisiting the same old stuff that they put on us before. But we should be smarter now. They are weaker now. Oh yeah, they got all of these tanks and all of these machine guns and all of this stuff, but they're weaker now. And the reason why they're weaker is because people are talking about it. People are talking about what they're doing. They have to explain themselves. How can you explain SWAT teams and machine guns and snipers for peaceful demonstrators? How could you confuse that? That's a clear, clear argument. And on television, too. It was, it was like, uh, what was that? A Katrina woman. Remember Katrina? You know, black folks thought that, you know, if things go bad, you know, that the government would come in and bail them out. Yeah, we saw what happened. We saw who came in to, 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 to implement law and order. It was black water. It was mercenaries, the same mercenaries that are on trial right now for shooting, for shooting and killing dozens of people in Iraq. It was the mercenaries. We were the police. The police went to their community to protect their families. Now, if the police lived in that New Orleans community, if the police was organized in that core New Orleans community, if there was public safety district boards that controlled policing in those communities, many lives would have been saved. And we would have had policemen that couldn't go nowhere because they lived with you. So we have to understand, we have to make these things issues. Mobilization of the, of the most marginalized in our community. Demanding that the police, that the police be held accountable. Not in a in terms of just uh, 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 indictments for when they do wrong, but to be held accountable by regulation. And the only way we can do that is to take the power of the police away from the mayor, to take the power of the police away from the police chief and put it in our community. Now, if they want to have a police chief for Wall Street or some buildings downtown, hey, that's cool, that's property, you know? Protect the property, we hear that. But when it comes to us, in our community, and our children, we want policemen in our community that treat us the way they want to be treated because they live there with us. They want our community to come up. And this is, I, I can't emphasize this enough because this is the lesson that Imam Jamil's incarceration teaches us. Because if we had this, he would have never got transferred out of Georgia. If we had this, the cops that came to his house would have came to his house and informed him about the plot rather than trying to kill him. Have we heard any policeman inside the police department in New York City giving us confidential information? Any black cops? Have they come forward? They're not snitching on the same institution that they claim they revile and that they claim is racist. They're part of the problem. And they're part of the problem because an individual cannot change institutions. One good cop is not going to change an institution that's dedicated to the brutality and control of former slaves, of the ancestors of former slaves. It's not possible. We have to change these institutions. We have to get, mobilize our youth and mobilize our people. And now finally, I just want to go and say this. When we leave from here this evening and we step outside, we're all going to go about our lives and try to do what we do. You know, there's a lot of people in here that's been struggling for years. I can see faces here that I haven't seen in a long time. You know, and, you know, coming together like this, you know, kind of like rejuvenates us. You know, it, it, it builds up our juices and helps us <coughs> keep on struggling. But what I want you to think about when you leave here this time is think about how the next time that we get a chance, we are going to take those politicians that supposedly elected us and we're going to confront them in public and demand that they take a position on Imam Jamil right. Alami and political prisoners.
We could bring this issue up in forums around the world. But only, like in the case of Mumia in Philadelphia, only when the people in Philadelphia show up in their masses to demand Mumia's release will they understand that Mumia is part of that Philadelphia community. We go to Philadelphia all the time, and Pam and them know this. We come from all over the country. Whenever they call, they say, hey, look, we need y'all in Philly. We all show up. If we can make it, we get there. But what about the community in Philly? Why aren't they there? Exactly. You remember this guy Good said, the mayor said, he was scared of the police all the time he was the mayor of Philadelphia. He was afraid. That's why he authorized the bombing. And they didn't just bomb move, they bombed the whole neighborhood. Now, if people don't get that message, I don't know what to say. People are looking at Ferguson and just look at Philadelphia. It was SWAT teams and a helicopter with a bomb. The same militarized police. Look at Boston. They locked down the whole city of Boston looking for one man. And everybody thought that that was, that was good. You know, because there was a bombing and people, innocent people were killed. But nobody thought anything about this military that they rolled out in mass and locked everybody down. They didn't think about it. And then when Ferguson jumped off, the bell went off. Whoa, look at these guys. All want to be SWAT teams, all special forces. It's their mentality. We are not going to turn this around unless we go to the streets. The streets. We need to set up, we need to get, we, one of the things that we should try to do, we need to set up tables in front of the precincts to register voters to decentralize police. You know, we, used to, we, used to go, we should go to National Action Network down, we should go down the street uptown to Sharpton School and say, look, we registering voters and we want to set up a voter registration table on, in front of the 32nd precinct, okay, in front of the 42nd precinct in the Bronx. Set it up in front of all the precincts, big old sign. Decentralized police here. Vote to decentralize police here. Watch their response. Watch the response. Now you gotta understand that you're exercising your constitutional right. You're in the streets. Hey brother, hey sister, come on over here, man. Take this. This is a voter registration. You just fill this out here and we'll get in contact with you and get you the form. You got a felony? Don't worry. We have a committee of attorneys and we're submitting these papers uh, uh, to this board so that we can process you so you can get your civil rights back so that you can vote. We're doing this in mass. We're organizing in mass. We have to organize people on the ground. The biggest way, the only way we'll get Imam Jamil out of prison and our political prisoners free is when the enemy understands that that's the best thing that they should do. Right now, it's mind over matter. They don't mind and Imam Jamil don't matter. We have to make them accountable. This is why we're traveling abroad to make people understand that these are our brothers and sisters in prison and they're suffering. And they're suffering just like the prisoners in, 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 in Palestine, just like the prisoners in, 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 in Abu Ghraib. Everything that they did in those prisons, they did it to us first. All of these techniques. We was in the box, remember? Unit 14, what they used to do in the winter to us? In the winter, they open the windows and turn off the heat. And in the summer, they close the windows and turn up the heat. What they used to do to us? Huh? What they did to these same people, they used to remember when we used to go up to the box, you used to have to go up on the elevator by yourself with your handcuffs back and they'd throw you in the chair, shave off all your hair. Because this was the time when the Afro was the symbol of black pride. So the best way to humiliate a black man was to tie him down and cut his hair off. We went through all that. We done been there and did that. Everything that they thought that they could do to a political prisoner, they did to us first. If we, want to go, if we really want to go back, we can go back to the plantation. They talk about decapitation of ISIL. They mutilated and decapitated us and roasted us on spits and hung us from trees. And they're going to act like they are 
uh, 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 shot by the brutality and barbarism of other people. Inhumanity, inhumanity and barbarism is inhumanity and barbarism no matter where it comes from. I've had the distinct, I don't know how to say it, honor maybe, to be a caseworker in Africa for people who are refugees from Sierra Leone in the Liberian Civil War. And the stories that young children used to tell me about decapitation of their mothers and fathers in front of their very eyes or fleeing into the bush at three o'clock in the morning or watching their grandfather skewered by a bayonet and tortured or watching their sister's baby ripped out of her stomach and the baby bayonet. These are children telling me these stories. I used to have nightmares. This is giving me a distinct hatred for men with guns for people who bring war, famine, and destitution to other people. But I understand one thing that Americans, especially white folks, they do not respect anyone or anything that they do not fear. We have to make them fear us. And not fear us, not fear us as terrorists, not fear us as people who are going to commit violence at the drop of a hat, but fear our organization, determination, and the fact that we could marshal millions and millions of people around a single idea. And that idea is that it's time for us to determine our own destiny in our community. And if anyone isn't down with that program, they need to take a hike. And Imam Jamil and our political prisoners, they are only the symbols of this long struggle. They don't have any movement anymore. The movements that put them in prison don't exist anymore. So when people come forward to call for their freedom and say, well, they should be free because, you know, they're innocent, they didn't get a fair trial, or, or someone has come forward and confessed, that's not the issue. Guilt to innocence is not the issue. Nobody said Mandela was innocent of anything that he did. The legitimacy of the anti-apartheid movement is what made Mandela a political prisoner, not his individuality. The legitimacy of the movement is what makes Imam Jamil, his history is what makes him a political prisoner. He could, if he was guilty of sin, it wouldn't make a bit of difference because we have a right to defend ourselves. We have a right to liberate ourselves. Our movement has that right. And that's the struggle. Yes, we should ally ourselves with people who are against the death penalty. It was the alliance with people against the death penalty and other progressive people that got Mumia off death row. It was the massive work that Pam Africa and, 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 and the MOVE people did for years, years, that got him off of death row. But now the enemy thinks that because he's in population, there's that urgency isn't there no more that no longer his death, his life isn't threatened no more, so now we could relax. We have to put the pedal to the metal now more than ever. That's right, that's right, that's right. We really have to get down more than ever now because the enemy is vulnerable. You remember just a couple of years, just a year or so ago, they came out and put a bounty on the side of Shakur's head. And it was at the urging of the police union, and I said then that this was masking a move that the Obama administration was gonna make later on in, before he got out of office to change the relationship of the U.S. to Cuba. And that the police said, you can't do that without considering the fact that you have exiles in Cuba that kill, that kill cops. And that you're not going to get the support of, 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 of the police, the national police and the police unions if you don't make some type of provision. If you're going to change the relationship of Cuba, they have to turn over Assad. They have to turn over Guillermo. They have to turn over these political prisoners. This is the backdrop behind all of that. And we see now that the Obama administration has been making those overtures to do that, okay? And we also see now that it was the police union that was behind the whole move to have Assad put on the 10 most wanted terrorists. It was the police union. They didn't forget. We're the ones that forgot. They knew who she was. But they also knew that there was no, she didn't have a movement anymore to counter that. The movement was dead. People had moved on. 
So brothers and sisters, let's not support our political prisoners and urge people to support them based on guilt or innocence, based on our moral and ethical opposition to the death penalty. Don't give up your moral and ethical opposition to the death penalty. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying our political prisoners came from a movement in a period of time in which we fought and we struggled as best we could for our freedom. And they need to recognize that. And if there's going to be any reconciliation, that has to happen. That has to occur. If we're going to lay the past to rest, we have to release our political prisoners. We've died and suffered and marched and were murdered and did everything we could so that we would not have to have a generation to suffer the fate of a Michael Brown. And yet we failed. Today is still going on. We have to change how we are approaching our political prisoners. And we have to demand, in place of a movement that they no longer have, that these were our freedom fighters. And as our freedom fighters, we wouldn't care if they shot the moon. They have to be released. If you could forgive, if you could forgive, the, if you could forgive, what's her name? What's her name? What's her name? Uh, Patty Hearst. If you could forgive all of these other individuals, talk about the hard life they had and the things that they went through, then you could release our political prisoners. But they won't do it if we don't flex some muscle. We can't call boycotts and all the stores stay open. We can't call a million man march and 35 people show up. Only opportunists do that. A million youth march, a million grandmother march, a million uncles march. We look, all of these and all the marches, the most they have is maybe a thousand people, if that. When you call a boycott, it's to flex your political muscle. It's to show the opposition, you know, we could shut this, we could shut this bad boy down tomorrow if we want to. And you don't want us to shut it down. What was the Montgomery bus boycott about? Shutting it down until it caused the economic crisis. We got to do that with New York. If you want the NYPD to change, shut it down. Shut down New York. Close New York. Make those police work overtime for you. Make them come out every day because every day there are demonstrations. Every day there's voter registrations in front of their spots. Every day there's people going to our, law, our lawyers, and I mean our, our legal representatives, and demanding, when are you going to join us and putting a referendum on the ballot here in New York for decentralization of police? Let's mobilize whatever we have to get to get a referendum against the police unions in this city. That's the way we deal with our political prisoners. Go after the people that's keeping them in jail. Build a movement to freedom so that when we talk about our communities and to our children and in school, they'll say, we want H. Rap Brown free. We want Imam Jamil al -Amin free. So when my boy comes home from school in the, second, in, the, in the sixth grade, and he says, this is Black History Month, and these are the list of heroes that we could write about, Imam Jamil's name is on that list. So again, I want to thank everyone that came out tonight. And it's beautiful that you came out tonight for, for Imam Jamil and, 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 and our political prisoners. But the work has just begun now. When I leave here, I'm driving up to, I never even know this place, Five Points, Five Points, New York, where, um, where Abdul um, Majid is, is, is held. I'm going to visit him, and it's a four or five hour drive, so I'm, I'm going to get up there so I can see him in the morning. He's going to get a visit. And I want to be able to tell him, you know, that, you know, y'all have spent a lifetime in here, but this has changed out here now. People are no longer just struggling just to struggle. People have a strategic vision. We have an objective. We have goals that we want to achieve. And we all could achieve these goals doing the things that we do. We all have a contribution that we could make. Whether we're lawyers, whether we're doctors, whether we're activists, whether we're imams, whether we are just ordinary people, we have a role to play. But brothers and sisters, we cannot go on the way we have been going on. So again, thanks, Susan, and um, for giving me the privilege of talking and meeting my old comrades and stuff. 
and a lot of folks here. And I hope that what I, the words that I have said here, and some of the things that I've said, resonates with people and causes you to reflect and think about how you want your activism or where you want to go right now with your activism. But there's one thing for sure, we have to act now. This is a historical moment, and this country is in a perpetual state of war. And we know what happens to dissent during war. So again, thank you, and power to the people, and free all our political prisoners.